This is my review of the Coltrata Pro Model Deck by Prism. Uh, this is a free ride board that I've been skating for the past year and a half. I won this, uh, actually it's a, it's a little closer to two years. I won this for my second place finish at the Medusa Death Race in West Lafayette, Indiana. And I've been skating this board ever since, trying to figure out, you know, how do I want to ride it? How do I want to set it up? Is this even the right board for me? And frankly, I didn't know that answer to that question for a long time. I have been debating if this is the right board for me, if I can, uh, you know, set this up optimally. And I think I finally have, but admittedly, it took some modification to do so. Now this might on its very surface look like a cool little art thing, uh, but this is actually a carbon fiber wrap that I did on the bottom of this board. This board now has two layers of carbon fiber on the bottom, and we're gonna get into why I thought that this board needed that modification, and if, of course, if that was worth it. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that too much because I did already make a full length video describing this process, how I did it, the mistakes I made, and whether or not it was worth it, so check that out. Won't be discussing that too much, but at least the reasons for wanting to go through that process might be made a little bit more clear. So I wanna start off with my initial reactions to this board. Uh, when I first started writing this, it was probably in winter of 2021, and uh, my, my very first reaction setting it up was that the lack of concave was a little bit unsettling. I hadn't skated a board with this little concave yet. And so, um, you know, standing on this, starting to take some runs on it felt weird. It was a little uncomfortable. Very quickly, though, I, I came to the realization that I could stand just about anywhere on this board and feel okay. Uh, this board actually was just a really big lesson in, um, you know, my stance in free riding doesn't matter as much as I think it does, right? It's easy to get into the mindset that, you know, I, I need to have my stance perfect before I attempt this stand-up slide. Any little deviation could throw me off. Uh, but this board kind of taught me that you can have some, you know, you can have some error in where you're standing. You can be biased around the board a little bit differently um, every single time you throw a, a stand-up slide, and that's okay. Um, you know, of course, there's reward for having precision. There's reward for having your feet go in the same place every time. There's consistency there. Um, but as my free riding has gotten better and better, I found that I'm able to make those adjustments on the fly a lot easier. And the lack of concave, the lack of features on this deck, I mean, I'll attempt to show you here. This is a great time to just cut really quick and say, uh, if you enjoy these videos and want to see when they come out ASAP, subscribe to the channel. It helps me out a lot. Uh, every time I, you know, remind you to subscribe, it always boosts my numbers a lot. So I know it's annoying to do the YouTube thing, but it actually helps. So thank you for sitting through this. Uh, like the video if you find this kind of stuff helpful. If you like getting Getting really nerdy about longboard gear and of course comment what you think about this board have you skated it have you seen it what's made you buy this board versus why didn't you uh, put that all below do all the interactive YouTube things uh, thank you so much uh, yeah I mean it's got nothing going on it is extraordinarily flat um, the lack of concave on this board I thought at first was a hindrance but it was easy to get used to. Um, I love that the ride height is low. It's a little harder to tell that this has flush mounts now that I've carbon wrapped it. Um, but the flush mounts from the factory uh, lower that ride height really nicely, which I think is nice for free riding. I don't like when my board is fully top mounted and has a high ride height for free ride. Um, lower ride height means slightly more forgiving slides. Uh, I find it a little easier to hold out stand-up heel side slides in particular. Um, and so low ride height was a, a good uh, initial factor for me. Um, the width of this board is awesome. I think it's sitting at like 9.5 inches wide. Um, of course, you can look up all the stats and wheelbases and stuff for this. Uh, this video is not to tell you things that you can find online, right? Anybody can go on Mirror Skate or Motion Board Shop and look up the specs of this board. Uh, but what you're not going to see 
is the stuff I want to share in this video. Um, the width is awesome. I really like a wide free ride board. I personally start to struggle when my free ride boards are around nine inches. That's kind of my threshold for feeling a little uncomfortable, uh, particularly with heel side slides. Getting pressure down through my heel starts to fail at around a nine inch width for me. Um, so having the nice wide width of this board meant that I could hand out or hold out squats, stand-ups super easily. I will say the width of this board made toe sides a little bit floaty, um, a little bit imprecise. I will say that stand-up toe side slides are uh, made a little bit more crisp and a little bit more controllable with a narrower board in my opinion uh, But that adjustment was not too hard to make and I've definitely thrown the biggest stand-up toe sides of my life on this setup um, The back toe placement on this deck was a little bit awkward uh, It was a little hard to find and get used to uh, I'm a regular rider, so my left foot is forward, my right foot is back, and you can see where my right foot is on this deck. And this is where I would get up onto my toe for a toe side slide. Um, it's hard to see, but there is like a valley here that is created because the curvature of the board and the concave has to flatten out before they can start to bend the kicktail up. This is due to just properties of wood. Uh, imagine like putting a sticker on a helmet. That helmet has two axes of curvature because it's spherical. Uh, so that sticker is gonna like fold and crease in a weird way. It doesn't want to perfectly adhere to that surface. Uh, in a similar vein, wood doesn't want to bend in more than one axis at a time. Instead of having concave go all the way through the board, including the tail, they have to cancel the concave right here before they can scoop up into the tail. What that means is that this is really flat over by the back bolts. That's kind of nice for doing stand-up heels if you ride with your back foot all the way back over the truck or even behind the truck. Uh, but in stand-up toes, uh, and just a, a toe side position in general, if my foot is too far back, the board kind of falls away. It's like having a backwards torque block. Uh, the board kind of, you know, it, it goes from being a high concave down to a low concave, and that force kind of pushes your foot a little inward, a little over here. It was just a little bit uncomfortable. Um, since dealing with that, I've managed to like shift my stance more and more forward. Uh, and just my familiarity on this board, my comfort on this board has gone up a lot. So I'm a lot more reliably finding the same toe side position every time I go to throw a toe side on this board. Um, but I find that this pocket here is just a little bit too far forward. I wish that it had another like two inches going backward um, where the concave would stay the same all the way through these mounting holes. The kicktail is, and I say this a lot about longboard kicktails, is only good on the smallest wheelbase. It's my opinion, at least with the trucks that I've been using on this board, which is largely my 43 degree Paris Savants um, and wheels around 70 millimeters to 65 millimeters. Uh, I've tried K-Rhymes on this board, the 72 millimeter wheels, and that's probably the largest wheel that I would try are those Powell Kevin Reimer Pros because of the flush mounts. And then also the wider your board is, the more prone to wheel bite it is going to be. Uh, just because there's, uh, man, it's hard to explain exactly, but just take my word for it. Wider your board is, the more prone it is to wheel bite. Um, but back to the kicktail, uh, it really is only good on the smallest wheelbase. I've skated this board on just about every wheelbase it has to offer, and um, I, I like that, right? Every wheelbase has a different flavor. Uh, it feels good. It's, it's nice to have this room for adjustment, to, to mess around with it. You know, bigger wheelbases for slightly more forgiving, floatier slides, smaller wheelbase for more precision and more, um, you know, feedback in the slides. Right now I'm skating the smallest wheelbase, which I think is 22 and a half inches approximately. Um, and I've been really successful in that lately. I haven't always skated the smallest wheelbase on this board just because I found it to be sometimes a little more punishing than I want. Uh, but that's aside from what we're talking about. We're talking about the kicktail. Uh, yeah, if you put the kicktail any further back, it just starts to make the pop too steep for my taste. And it means that the tail hits later and the board goes steeper before the tail hits the ground. It's just harder to get that leverage up into the air. Um, I much prefer it on the smallest wheelbase. And then in that case, the board has a ton of pop. 
Uh, I prefer a flat kick tail. I like when the transition from uh, like flat to kick is short and then the kick tail is like very flat on this plane. I'd say this kick tail is a little scooped. Uh, it has kind of curvature going through the whole thing and that's just not a feeling I really like. I'm a street skater at heart. I've been riding street skateboards, you know, for, for ages, around skate parks, around town, all that stuff. And those always have pretty flat kick tails. So this kick tail being curved, I'm not a huge fan of, but I could see how that would be beneficial for riders who want to do like free ride style skating with their foot on the kick tail. That scoop kind of helps cup your foot a little bit better, help you get a little more leverage. Uh, this is a pretty good board for doing like blunt slides on. I like that a lot. You get a nice little pocket in here for your blunt slides. Um, purely for tricks though, I like a flat kick tail and this one's a little too scoopy for me. In the long term, uh, a few more realizations I had about this board really put me on like the make it or break it point of wanting to ride this setup or not. Um, first and foremost is the torsional flex issues. This board being an eight ply maple, you know, it's a big eight ply with a, you know, a lot of width. It has flush mounts in it. It has uh, wheel flares and you're taking out material when you do that. Oh. Also, notably, it has these grab rails, which I think is a total gimmick. Um, I'm just gonna go out and say it. I think the grab rails are silly. Um, I understand why they put it in there. I mean, Coltrana does a lot of grabs, uh, like early grab tricks in his video parts that he's put out. And this is a great way to commemorate that and to, you know, market this board, make it unique, uh, have more reasons for people to buy it because they see that as another feature. Um, I think it's kind of dumb and, you know, you're taking material out of an area on the board that's critical for helping it prevent torsional flex. Uh, so if it were me, I would not have these rails in here at all. I, I don't think they do anything for the board. Uh, but also, I'm not a person that does a lot of early grabs. So if you're a person that does a lot of early grabs and you like these, then let me know in the comments. Again, I want to hear your opinion. Yes, so the torsional flex is an issue on this board, which is why I put carbon fiber on it, is to stiffen up this board. Um, did it work? Yes. Uh, I noticed this board is significantly stiffer now that I put on carbon. It's not perfect because I don't think I did the carbon fiber weave in the correct axes to eliminate torsional flex optimally, but it did help. Um, the couple of ways that I find the torsional flex, uh, also I'm saying this word a lot and I haven't explained it. In case you don't know, torsional flex is twisting force in your board. Um, you know, it's, it's twist down the middle axis of the board. Um, this is opposed to like a sort of hammock type of flex where the board is sagging in the middle um, and then any of the other flex axes don't matter. Um, torsional flex is the one that I really like when companies try to eliminate because it affects the way your board steers. Uh, notably in toe sides, uh, a lot of riders steer a lot more in toe side turns with their back foot than their front foot. That's just because of human anatomy. It's a lot easier to put pressure through your back toe than it is your front toe in your like a turning stance. Um, what happens when you have a pressure differential between the back and the front means that you're putting a lot of force here and the front foot's almost countering that much force. And so the board is going to twist downward and untwist itself by the time it gets to the front truck, meaning that all of that steering input is gonna primarily go into the back truck and then maybe 60% of that steering input's actually gonna fully translate to the front truck on a board that struggles with torsional flex. Steering toe side, my back truck will steer more than my front truck and be really prone to oversteer. It'll be hard to hold a line through a corner because it almost, it wants to drift out too hard. Um, also, this can feel a little weird in tuck leans. It can feel a little bit inconsistent in heel side turns, like getting pressure down consistently. Uh, and then of course, setting up for slides when you're pre-carving and putting pressure through the specific points on the board to kind of, you know, initiate that slide with a, a nice, quick, deft kick. 
Um, that can feel really inconsistent on boards with torsional flex. So what I do on this board, and this is not for everybody, of course, uh, I think Cole Trotta himself rides this board symmetrical. I'm not a person that likes riding switch. Um, I can do it very, very little. Uh, so this tip is not relevant uh, to people that like switch and want to be able to skate this board switch, which you can because it's perfectly symmetrical, right? Um, I use like a four or five degree angle split between my front and my rear truck. So these 43 degree Paris, I ride a 43 in the front and I de-wedge it with a Pat's risers five degree wedge in the rear to get it down to 38. That means that when I have torsional flex and I'm putting more steering force through the back truck than I am the front truck, it's not going to steer more than the front truck will. It still is biased to steer less because of the lower angle. And so even if it's getting more, you know, energy put through it than the front truck, more twisting force put through it, uh, it's never going to outrun the front truck and create wobbles and oscillations. Pat's risers are made really minimally, so they add almost no ride height to your board when you're de-wedging. So I highly recommend trying that. I will warn you against using a big angle split like what you would see on slalom trucks. So like my Don't Trip Downhill Sybens I have set at 50 degrees and the back one at 20 degrees. Uh, don't do that on this board, especially... Uh, because the torsional flex means that you're almost going to get no steering out of the back truck and all of your input's going to be lost before it gets to the front truck. Um, it's, it's funny that it works both ways, that it can oversteer the back truck, but on too big of a torsional or too big of an angle split, it just takes away your steering leverage altogether. And I find that that makes cornering really hard on, on big splits. So it's like you want to find the balance in between a big like slalom split versus a very minuscule, uh, almost symmetrical split. Other way I'd set this board up is with trucks that are from 160 to 180 millimeters wide. Um, I, in my opinion, it's okay on a free ride board to have your wheels poke out from the edge a little bit. Um, rail match is a lie. Don't listen to people who are worried about rail match. But if you do go kind of below that 160 millimeter or the like nine inch is kind of approximately the same size. Um, if you go smaller than that, then, you know, the wheels are going to be pretty tucked under the board, at least if you're using free ride wheels that don't have a strong offset. Um, so, you know, 160 to 180, that's going to cover most of your cash trucks on the market. That's where I'd stay at with this board. I personally would not set this board up for like race style skating. I just don't think it excels in that category. So to wrap this up, um, I think this board is pretty great. I think it's a, an awesome board if you're getting into downhill. Uh, I think experienced downhill skaters are also going to like it. Um, if you have kind of the feeling for detecting like torsional flex. You might notice that in this board and be a little bit disappointed, but quite frankly, that's not something I was able to tell just by riding a board um, until maybe like three years into doing downhill, maybe two years into doing downhill. That's when I started to notice like, oh, boards with torsional flex have these properties. So, you know, I say this board is flexy, but it in the grand scheme of things, it's not. This is more than stiff enough for downhill. It's going to be a great board for anybody learning free ride. I think the wheelbase options on it are awesome, that they're really relevant to today's sizes of boards and like the preferences that riders usually have. Um, I've not run out of uh, like, you know, options to have fun experimenting with this setup. And I continue to mess around with it, although I'm feeling extremely dialed on the 4338 split on the smallest wheelbase. Uh, that's been really strong for me so far. Um, of course, I modified the board to have carbon fiber, but this has only improved my riding just a little bit, right? It added maybe a 5% improvement and over $100 worth of modification cost to a $170 board. I think that's how much this board is. Um, consider that my opinion might be biased because I did not pay full price for this board. In fact, I didn't pay anything. I won it. Uh, but I think $170 is a little bit steep for this deck. 
Um, I, I think that's just like slightly more expensive than it should be, especially when compared with the other boards in the Prism and Madrid lineup. But if you consider that this is a pro model board that I'm sure some of the profits are going into supporting Cole Trotta, making really phenomenal content that gets everybody in the downhill scene excited, uh, I think that spending a little bit more money to support a pro downhill rider to support the scene uh, is worth it. And that this board, you're going to have a lot of fun with it if you get it. Um, I've had a lot of fun with it. It's been really fun to tune. I like when a board has that kind of variability so that, you know, somebody like me who likes to get nerdy and technical with their downhill setups can spend hours getting it just perfect. And this board has absolutely allowed me to do that. Uh, and I have a special thank you to all my patrons. Uh, in this first couple months of trying out Patreon, it has been incredibly successful. Um, I'm really thrilled with the support that we've had on there, and very soon I'll be mailing out my patrons, um, at least my, my two-month-old patrons, uh, some goodie boxes of a bunch of 3D printed downhill parts that I designed and have already showed on this channel. So if you want to get in on that, check out my Patreon. Um, the tier to get uh, some 3D printed stuff is five bucks a month, and after two months I'll send you a little care package as a thank you. Uh, and I really hope that you stick around for after that amount of time because I've, you know, it's been four weeks since I posted on YouTube. During this time, I haven't stopped posting on Patreon. I have almost daily posts over on Patreon where I'm posting unboxing videos, uh, first reaction videos, recaps from testing, things like that. And it's all these this little unpolished content that I don't think is good enough for like Instagram or YouTube. Uh, but it's really fun to put on there and get people's input as I start messing around with gear. Uh, we've got some really cool trucks that I'm getting ready to do some like first reactions on on Patreon. So if you want in on that stuff, highly recommend you go check it out. And there's a bunch of tiers, you can go read about them. Uh, and thank you so much to the patrons that are posted on screen now for their continued support. Um, I appreciate you all so very much and I hope you have a wonderful day.